Our anime starts off bloody and tense. We see a young boy named Toka Mamori being scolded by his father, who not only yells at him but also starts hitting him. The boy can only apologize as he is beaten, while his mother seems more interested in her afternoon soap opera than in her son. The boy endures until he passes out. When he opens his eyes, we see him as an older version of himself, waking up from a nightmare during a school trip. One of his classmates is upset because a boy named Oyamata took a girl's romantic novel. She complains loudly, making the whole bus aware of what she likes. This annoys other students like Tomohiko Yasu, who feels bad for her, while others don't seem to care. They just want the school trip to distract them from their tough daily lives. Among the students, we have Hijiri Takao, who treats her sister Itsuki like a servant, even though she calls her boss. Another student, Kabato Kashima, is also not happy with the bus drama as Oyamata continues to bother the girl who just wants her book back. Our protagonist remembers how the class representative had a hard time in the past. He felt sorry for her but knew it was unavoidable. The only normal people on the bus seem to be the Takao sisters and their teacher, Tamatsu Sakuraji. Despite everything, Ayaka tries to get her book back. Oyamata agrees to return it if she accepts him on a social network called Rain. As the situation escalates, our protagonist, Toka Mimori, unexpectedly asks Oyamata to stop the show. This surprises both Oyamata and Toka himself, who doesn't know why he stood up to help Ayaka but tries to get the book back peacefully, which only causes more laughter. In the end, another student, Takuto, steps in and asks Oyamata to stop, but Oyamata is just getting started. What better way to pass time on a boring trip than by bothering a nobody? However, Takuto didn't want to waste his time on a true nobody like our protagonist, so he declined to help. Still, he insisted on getting the book back, which impressed another student, Asajai Kasaba, who respected Takuto a lot. Even Oyamata quickly returned the book to Ayaka and apologized for going too far, though he was secretly unhappy about it. He started hitting Tomohiko's seat, frustrated that another loser like Toka dared to confront him. Finally, their teacher shouted for silence, reminding everyone that this was supposed to be a peaceful school trip. Despite everything, Toka knew Oyamata was right, under normal circumstances, he would never have stood up like that. Remembering a bit of his past, Toka couldn't help but take action. As the trip continued, a strange light began to shine inside the bus until it completely disappeared, leaving all the students in a mysterious place where a woman greeted them and called them heroes. She introduced herself as the goddess Viseus and explained that they had been summoned to the kingdom of Alien because a great demon empire was about to start a war. Whenever this happens, new heroes are called upon to help the kingdom. She told them how heroes had defeated evil 200 years ago and continued to do so. The queen asked for their strength and support. While some students thought this was just a bad joke and others believed it was a dream, their teacher asked them to stay calm and pay attention to the goddess, who had captivated their interest. For Toka, it still felt like another dream, just like the one he had that morning, and he tried to wake up again. Takuto and Oyamata's group didn't waste any time and immediately asked if they were summoned to defeat unknown demons. The queen confirmed this, emphasizing that if they didn't complete the task, they would never return to their old world. This wasn't a threat but a fact. According to the goddess, the spell to return them home could only be recreated with the essence of the Dark Lord, which could be obtained in two ways, directly from the heart of the demon king or by using an iron pendant she showed them, which could absorb the demon's essence. Oyamata thought this was ridiculous since either way, they would have to face the demon king. The goddess showed respect by bowing to the heroes and asking for their help. This prompted Ayaka to ask the obvious question, how are ordinary humans expected to defeat powerful demons, especially without any prior experience? The goddess assured them that this wouldn't be a problem because she believed they all had something special since the hero spell had chosen them. This infuriated Oyamata even more, and as he complained, the castle soldiers brought in a strange beast that devoured an innocent man in front of the entire class. The goddess used this to demonstrate her power, making the class realize that this was no joke. Accepting their new reality, Hijiri proposed that they decide what to do next. The queen invited them to discover their abilities. The first student to go didn't receive anything special, and most of the class didn't get notable abilities either. Oyamata, however, was an exception and received a powerful crimson light. This was outdone by Takuto, whose golden light shattered the evaluation crystal. The queen congratulated him for easily obtaining an S rank, which meant special. Oyamata, feeling jealous, found out he had an A rank. Then another crystal was shattered by Ayaka, who also received an S rank. Hijiri got an A rank, and her sister became the third consecutive S rank in the class, making the goddess extremely pleased with her summon group. Finally, it was Toka's turn. He saw a strange violet color, making him the only one whose crystal didn't shine like his classmates. The goddess had the final word, 
so she struck the young woman until she fainted. The rest of the class did nothing, which enraged Toka. He tried to attack the goddess, but his only ability couldn't even touch her because she had an impenetrable shield activated all the time. However, Takuto managed to pierce the shield with a trial shot. With everything said and no one opposing, the goddess asked Toka for his last words. He recalled more of his past, or he was beaten and developed an alternate personality to survive his hellish life. This internal version told him never to hold back again. In the present, Toka finally listened and insulted the goddess in the worst way in front of his classmates. Despite this, he was sent to the waste ruins. Upon arriving, he encountered a strange demon that chased him until he could run no more. After stumbling in with no other options, Toka remembered his immobilization ability, successfully stopping the demon. He seized the chance to run away as fast as he could. However, another demon, this time a bird, appeared right in front of him. He used immobilization again, which worked very well, and noticed that these abilities consumed his mana points. With no other options, he used poison on the monster, discovering that while he wasn't very strong, he could mix immobilization and poison to survive. Using abilities drained his energy, which he quickly felt. As he struggled, the first demon reappeared, and Toka realized he had no way out. He knew this was the perfect moment for someone to save him, but also knew this was real life. He accepted his fate, knowing he was never meant to live in this world where the goddess's world, or his classmates didn't care about his banishment. Remembering more of his harsh childhood where he was beaten, something awakened inside Toka, and he seemed ready to face whatever came next. Without fear of running out of life points, Toka cast his paralyzing spell on one of the beasts stalking him. However, the spell had no effect, and his system alerted him to the problem. The same technique cannot be cast on the same target multiple times. In a desperate final act, he used a sleep spell, which worked perfectly and saved his life by putting the beast to sleep. Attempting a different approach, he found that the spells could stack with each other, but this didn't change the fact that his mana points were at zero and the enemies remained a significant threat. With multiple consecutive paralyzing spells, he managed to significantly reduce his enemy's health. Tuka was on the verge of passing out from fatigue, surrounded by terrifying moments as more enemies approached. With death seemingly seconds away, our protagonist chose the path of the warrior, casting all the paralyzing spells he could. This brought him to his limit, but luckily it gave him enough XP to level up to level 2, where his mana points were restored and multiplied tenfold. Tuka wondered how he had leveled up, recognizing the beast he had recently defeated. It made no sense to him that he had gained so much experience from a single kill. This could only mean one thing, so he immediately began defeating as many enemies as possible, quickly leveling up again. The system not only rewarded him with magic points but also upgraded his abilities with new advantages, such as targeting multiple enemies at once. This allowed him to stop all the beasts in an instant. Despite saving his life, Tuka couldn't shake a strange feeling. Although his new ability was powerful, it still couldn't compare to the goddess who had condemned him to death. Realizing he had more to uncover, our protagonist tried casting the paralyzing spell on a defeated enemy again, only for his system to remind him that it wasn't possible. Since the beast had already been affected by the spell before, Tuka had no choice but to poison all the beasts. Remember, spells can stack, and this led to another level up. Tuka was thrilled with his achievements, and when he checked his system, he noticed all his abilities had been multiplied by his level. His magic points had skyrocketed, which was great news since they powered his spells. As another beast died near him, his points multiplied excessively, reaching level 321 with ease. The poison had just begun to take effect on the enemy beasts, causing his level to continue climbing. To speed up the process, Tuka used his new sleep ability, which also leveled up quickly with repeated use. Despite reaching level 501, Tuka knew he couldn't be complacent, he had to survive to exact his revenge on the goddess. Unfortunately, his enemies fled upon realizing his power. An old adventurer perished in an attempt to survive, and Tuka took his belongings. Continuing his journey, Tuka encountered more beasts. Although he defeated them, hunger remained a problem. He attempted to eat one of the beasts, but their tough skin forced him to find a different part, like the eye, to consume. The meat was acidic and tasted horrible, leaving Tuka with no other options. Desperate, he ate the eye, which confirmed that the beast's bodies were acidic. Tuka began to accept his defeat in the dungeon. However, the survival bag he had been given started to change color mysteriously. Investigating it, he found junk food inside, which delighted the starving boy. He wasn't sure how it worked or if the bag would provide food again. Days passed in this hellish environment. Tuka continued to poison and defeat groups of enemies, leveling up repeatedly due to his massacre. However, the constant violence began to affect his mind. Despite being human and unaccustomed to such acts, memories from his childhood resurfaced. He remembered vowing at a young age to delete his mother's abusive boyfriend. Just then, a light appeared before him, and two people emerged, apologizing for taking so long to rescue him. These two were his uncles, who gave him a normal home for the first time in his life and offered to be the parents he never had. 
These memories flooded back to him, and as he reflected on the massacre and terror he had caused, he wondered if he truly felt remorse. However, his mind seemed to ignore these thoughts, leading him to believe he might be destined to be a monster. With his system open, Tuka reviewed all his achievements and quickly accepted his new self, realizing the old Tuka was gone since being left to die in the dungeon. Continuing his journey, he found more fallen adventurers and an ancient sword, feeling only respect for them. He dedicated a minute of silence to their memory before moving on. Even new monsters no longer surprised him, paralyzing them and using poison, he could defeat them swiftly. Exploring further, Tuka discovered that the area he was in was different from where he usually wandered. He found a blue gem that seemed to require some magic. Using his mana, he activated it perfectly, opening a door to reveal more adventurers who had perished in their escape from the dungeon. Among them were likely two lovers who had chosen to die together. Tuka paid his respects and noticed they carried several blue gems, which he decided to take, hoping they might be useful. Time passed as he examined many doors, finally reaching one that required an immense amount of mana to open. When the doors finally opened, he was met with the same tragic scene but now featuring an adventurer with fresh wounds. In the adventurer's hand, Tuka found a note, which he could read thanks to his system's translation abilities. The letter revealed that the skeleton was once Anlin Bard, a great sage known as Anglin the Dark Hero. This name reminded Tuka of a time when Yasu gained his powers, and the goddess Vias mentioned the great dark hero who had once saved their world. However, the note presented a different story. Anglin explained that the goddess had sent him to the dungeon because he was no longer needed in their world and had become a nuisance. In a final attempt to leave a clue for future adventurers, Anglin left a few words. Tuka was overwhelmed by the realization of the atrocities committed by the goddess Vias. She had always portrayed the demonic empire as the villains, but her actions were not much different from theirs. Tuka began to understand that he might not be so different, as his desire for revenge was consuming him. The confrontation of evil against evil became clear in his mind. Among Anglin's possessions, Tuka found a hero's book filled with forbidden arts, recipes for medicines, and magical tools, which could be useful in the future. He also discovered a scroll of forbidden magic, though he couldn't read it. He wondered why a sage would guard such a relic, suspecting that deciphering it would grant immense power, possibly rivaling the queen herself. Before leaving, Tuka read more of the hero's book, which warned about the Soul Eater, a creature that had killed many. A quick vision of the Soul Eater appeared, but this did not deter Tuka. He continued exploring the area, noting a strange door that seemed to require a unique object to open. He suspected this object was connected to the Soul Eater, which might be the key to his escape. Checking his stats, Tuka felt confident in his high level. As he approached the door, it transformed into a face that immediately shot at him, warning him to be cautious against the Soul Eater. Despite the warning, Tuka decided to strategize and possibly level up further before confronting the creature. He realized that if the most powerful hero of the past couldn't defeat the Soul Eater, reaching this point might have been a grave mistake. As if things weren't already terrifying enough, the Soul Eater began to spew a strange substance from its mouth, which transformed into the final expressions of each of its victims, traumatizing Tuka further. The creature seemed to enjoy this moment immensely. It didn't attack Tuka directly, but the sight of these human replicas being poisoned tore his mind apart. Hurting what were essentially remnants of humans caused Tuka a great deal of stress, much to the delight of the Soul Eater, which summoned more human replicas to torment him. Unable to bear the horrific scene, Tuka noticed that the creature was laughing hysterically. Taking advantage of this distraction, he analyzed the Soul Eater, managing to deceive it just enough to launch a surprise attack. This clever maneuver caused his paralyzing spell to level up to three. Throughout this ordeal, Tuka thought of his uncles, who had given him the best life possible. He wondered if they had misunderstood his true intentions, and out of respect for them, he wanted to change who he was. However, in this new world, he realized he had to revert to his true self. After all, he was just a simple human who had managed to confront a legendary dungeon beast. It was time to finish the beast. Using his poison, which had also leveled up to three, Tuka defeated the Soul Eater. With the creature destroyed, he freed the souls of the fallen adventurers, who thanked him for avenging them before passing on to the afterlife. Among them was the soul of Anglin, who asked Tuka to defeat the goddess for him before departing. With the beast's gem in hand, Tuka vowed to fulfill this request. After many days, he had completed the first step of his plan, escaping the dungeon. Beyond this world, we witnessed a dangerous wolf being chased by Oyamata, who almost caught the beast. However, it didn't surrender easily. Another companion, Takuto, found it less challenging to defeat these creatures due to his superior power, he is already at level 18. Meanwhile, Yasu, newly chosen as the Dark Knight, managed to defeat his opponents, nearly losing his mind with his newfound powers. On the other side, Kabato struggled with taking lives. Ikusaba appeared, urging her to be more ruthless if she didn't want to die, and requested to be called by her name, Asagi, instead of her surname. Asagi also informed her that the group would soon split up, which made sense given their established ranks. She was abundant in the present, and Asagi hoped Kabato would join her group when the time came. Although Kabato seemed unsure, Asagi reminded her that she was a Class B and that a Class D girl like Kabato would never join an S-Class group. 
She mentioned Tuka, implying Kabato's innocence in understanding the situation. Asajai then took a direct approach, touching Kabato and making it clear that they could use whatever strengths Kabato had in this lawless world. With that, the rest of the girls brought a small, shackled monster for Kabato to kill, reminding her of the goddess's trial. Reluctantly, Kabato ended the creature's life, earning her a place in Asajai's group. This act was painful for the kind-hearted Kabato, who never wanted to live in this world, recalling her old cat that had once been hit by a car but was cared for by a kind duke, bringing tears to her eyes. Elsewhere, Ayaka woke up with a severe stomach pain, remembering it was from being struck by the goddess for opposing her decision to send a friend into a dangerous dungeon. With no other choice, she bravely went to see the goddess to seek answers. The goddess, shedding completely fake tears, began to apologize, claiming she would never do this if not for the sacred ritual that demanded adherence to ancient rules. Without these rules, her kingdom would never survive. Remembering she had been asleep for several days, she realized this presented a new problem. Her companions had significantly leveled up while she slept, and some couldn't even harm a monster. They needed to be eliminated immediately since heroes unable to fulfill their duties were useless. Ayaka interpreted this as a mandate to kill the weak, and the queen didn't deny it, stating it was her world's rules. Without these rules, she wouldn't harm a fly. Ayaka was furious and openly criticized the goddess for her cruel methods toward those who couldn't be heroes. The goddess found this amusing, accepting that the world had weak people who wouldn't understand her grand decisions. However, eliminating the useless was necessary. As an S-class, Ayaka promised to improve and excel in all areas, not just for herself but for the students who couldn't pass their trials. This was practically a deal with the goddess, who acknowledged it was a good idea and asked for a quick reconciliation, admitting the recent hit was hasty and senseless but necessary due to the uproar caused. With a firm handshake, all was forgiven. Upon leaving the room, Ayaka could only confirm that the goddess had the coldest hands she had ever touched. Meanwhile, a mysterious figure ran through the forest, chased by a strange group. A sinister-looking man named Blighting seemed to have found her trail, while another, Ashura, called out to the hidden princess knight, promising not to harm her. Sengai, another thug, ruined the ruse by suggesting they kill her, and Sarage, another pursuer, demanded the group focus, reminding them they were the sacred vigilantes, and no one had ever escaped them. Back to Tuka, who saw sunlight for the first time in ages, he quickly checked his system, noting he was now at level 1789 with over 59,000 mana points. He was interested in whether he could nullify his paralysis spell at will and stop his poison spell before it killed an enemy. This would need testing on a forest enemy. He knew he needed a powerful sword for close combat. Hearing a strange noise, Tuka investigated, finding wild slimes bullying a smaller one. He noted that this was life and there was nothing to do against it. However, when the small slime defended itself, Tuka was pleased and used paralysis and poison spells to see if a hidden menu existed. It did, allowing him to release the bullying slimes, who fled upon seeing Tuka's strength. Before freeing the small slime, Tuka praised it for defending itself and, surprisingly, the slime chose to follow him, likely because it was an OU Tukas like him. Finally, the exhausted princess realized she had enough time to formulate a plan to save herself. The small slime stayed with Tuka, serving as a rear guard in his hood, a benefit for the young man who knew befriending the slime was wise. Reading a book on forbidden techniques, Tuka found a spell to enhance monsters, which he hoped would benefit his new friend. But first, he needed to clarify things. Tuka revealed to the little slime that following him would mean facing many enemies, as his journey was one of complete vengeance. With this warning, the slime understood and accepted, and Tuka named him Pigamaru, a name the little slime loved. With clear determination, Tuka set his sights on the princess's castle, the one who had tried to kill him. Meanwhile, the princess hadn't gained as much time as she thought, with her pursuers hot on her heels. With no other option, she drew her sword to fight, invoking the grace of all the spirits she could. However, the thugs weren't after her, they encountered Tuka instead. Sheriz demanded all his valuables to spare his life, while Bidden wanted to kill him to satisfy his thirst for vengeance. The rest of the thugs argued over who would finish off Tuka, which made him angry, but he restrained himself. As they spoke of a woman and their vile plans for her, Tuka cowardly begged for his life. Taking advantage of the moment, he used his paralysis spell right before being struck, revealing that his ability worked on humans too, with perhaps only the goddess being immune. Remembering his past fear in the dungeon, Tuka realized he was no longer the weak person he once was. He swiftly decided to eliminate his enemies without remorse, using his poison spell. After the fight, Tuka sensed another presence nearby. Meanwhile, the princess wondered why she no longer felt her enemies. She cut through a bush and found Pigamaru, but Tuka quickly paralyzed her, noticing her strong bloodlust. Curious, he wanted to talk to her, being new to this world and lost, hoping for some help. The princess, despite being paralyzed, asked about the four people near her. Using his system, Tuka sped up her speech. Apologizing but cautious, he revealed he had killed them, surprising her since they were sacred vigilantes. Grateful for his honesty, she promised to answer his questions in return. After some conversation, Tuka learned he was now in the kingdom of Ulsa, far from Alien, 
or the princess had originally sent him. For his last question, Toka asked about his mysterious scroll, but the princess couldn't read it. However, she mentioned someone who might be able to, the Witch of the Kingdom, located in the land of the Golden-Eyed Monsters. With no further questions, Toka bid her farewell, assuring her that his spell would wear off in a few minutes. This made the princess happy, who wished him a good journey, reminding Toka of his kind aunt. As they left, Pigamaro asked why they didn't kill the princess, to which Toka replied that he never kills without reason and that they should move quickly to avoid her coming after them once freed. Pigamaro accepted his new mission to watch their backs, like a soldier.